Order. Um, we must now move on to questions to the Minister of Justice. Can I inform members that questions 6 and 10 have been withdrawn? And I call Mr David Hilditch. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Question 1. Principal Deputy Speaker, at the 9th of May 2014, there were 14 senior personnel positions within Forensic Science Northern Ireland. None of these posts are currently vacant. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Deputy Speaker, and do appreciate the, the, the question did uh, relate to a media article a few weeks ago in relation to difficulty filling a particular vacancy. Is the Minister then content uh, with the structures of the organisation, considering the criticism relating to processing times? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I think the issue of processing times is a rather different issue from the matter of staffing. Um, if the House wants the full detail on staffing, I believe there is currently one vacancy at an administrative assistant level out of 200 posts within FSNI. Uh, so there clearly isn't a significant staffing issue as was originally highlighted. There are a number of different initiatives underway to uh, improve the delivery of services for forensic science, most particularly in terms of speeding up. Uh, which involve things like the greater use of live links, the introduction of a rapid analysis scheme for cannabis, um, and a new streamlined process for other drugs. So significant work is being undertaken around the speeding up issue. Thank you. I'll call Ms. Karen McEvitt. Um, can I ask the Minister really assure the House that the, uh, the services uh, receive all the resources necessary um, within the, the, the Forensic Science Service uh, to run an efficient, efficient and effective service? Well, I thank Ms McEvitt for the question. Uh, the reality is that, um, as for example in medical science, forensic science is enhancing its capabilities quite significantly, and at a time of difficult budgetary pressures, it's always difficult to say we are capable of doing everything we would wish to do. But certainly under the transformation program which is underway, significant efforts are being made to streamline processes, to speed things up, and to reduce costs. We have, for example, uh, the first use of DNA-17 technology in the United Kingdom within FSNI as a clear example of good investment producing good results across the system. And I certainly believe as we look at the construction of the new lab and the introduction of an improved IT system, we will see good value for money. But as ever, we could always do with more resources for some of these services. Thank you. And I call Mr. Mr. Robinson. You're okay. Ockram. Thank you. Question number two, please. To date, the overall numbers of interface structures for which the Department of Justice has responsibility has been reduced from 59 to 53 in pursuance of our pro programme for government commitment. A further significant sign of progress is the level of engagement that is currently taking place around the future of other interface structures. Through DOJ-led initiatives and in conjunction with eight projects which are funded through the International Fund for Ireland Peace Walls Programme, there is engagement at some 40 of the remaining structures. There is also significant work ongoing with regard to those additional structures which are owned by the Housing Executive. Whilst there are examples of positive and progressive work, I acknowledge that in some locations people do not believe the conditions are yet right for the removal of structures. The important thing is that there is engagement to explore what is possible to bring about the conditions whereby they can support that change. My department will encourage and seek to facilitate, but it will not rush communities which are not ready. Community engagement and consultation remains at the heart of this process. What we all need to do now is to build on the progress already made, to build on the engagement and deliver a meaningful program of change that can bring physical, community, economic and social renewal to interface areas. In respect of the commitment contained in the TBUC strategy to remove these structures by 2023, I believe it is essential that we have a dedicated programme budget in place alongside a cross-executive commitment to address economic and social renewal as part of a holistic plan for interface areas. I also want to see an intensive programme of good relations work in these hard-to-reach areas. I know from the DOJ's engagement with interface communities that they would like more certainty about the strategy. I'm keen to secure that and to maintain the current momentum. Yeah, call Ms. Judith Cochran for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal, De Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister um, for his answer. Would the Minister agree with me um, that the commitment of communities to change, um, even on an incremental basis, um, is hugely encouraging? And what more does he believe that the Executive um, can do to support and encourage communities to make further progress? 
Well, I thank my colleague for that question. I certainly think the fact that we have engagement around 40 of the 53 remaining interface structures, and we have seen six removed since the Department of Justice came into creation, is a sign of good work. Um, it does annoy me when media references are made to the fact that there are now more interface structures than there were at the time of the Good Friday Agreement, when the trajectory in the last four years has been for removal and not new structures being added. But what is absolutely clear is that we do need a detailed program of neighbourhood renewal around interface areas to provide people with the other improvements which are beyond the remit of my department. Uh, the DOJ can fund structures and can fund the removal of structures, but where improvement is needed to uh, in the local environment, whether it be through roads or other measures, other departments, uh, particularly DSD and DRD, have responsibilities, and there's the need for a single funding stream to ensure that we can have a holistic program which addresses the needs of those who live in interface areas in a way which builds confidence and enables people to gradually see structures uh, opened up a bit and eventually removed. And I call Ms. Rosie McCorley. I'm going to pray the last one call you. I'm going to pray the last one Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers up to now. Would the Minister agree that the marching season has a negative impact on the uh, attempts to achieve local consensus uh, and to reduce the number of peace walls? Well, I think Ms. McCauley has a point, Principal Deputy Speaker. There are clearly times of the year when it is easier to make progress than other times. But the fact is that the 40 areas where we have ongoing engagement, engagement continues through the marching season. Clearly, uh, how much of it is open and how much of it is something done in relative quiet meetings between people from uh, different sides of the interfaces uh, is a matter which has to be addressed. But I do believe that what we're seeing, particularly in the work aided by the Community Relations Council, Belfast City Council and the IFI, is an ongoing programme of detailed engagement which is producing results right through the year. I'm going to call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm sure the Minister is aware that, that those who live closest to these structures uh, have a concern that their voices may be drowned out effectively in the consultation by those who live at some remove uh, from those structures. So what steps has the Minister taken uh, to ensure appropriate weight is given to the opinions of those who live in the actual shadow of these structures? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I don't think that it's the case that voices are drowned out. When my officials engage with communities, when others such as CRC and the IFI led groups work, they look at the entire needs of an area and in particular at the kind of issues that I was addressing when I responded to Mrs. Cochrane in the first place. It is not a matter of simply weighing up numbers. It is a matter of looking at what the needs of the entire area are. That is the kind of work which has been done in those areas where we've seen removal of structures, and that is the work which is continuing in the 40 other areas at this time. And I call Mr. Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Would the Minister accept that in terms of consultation, regarding peace walls, that another factor that has to be considered is the murals, the paramilitary related murals. What can the Minister state or say in relation to his attitude about those going forward in order to make sure that we have less of a chill factor created where there is a glorification of paramilitary violence? Well, Mr. Byrne will not be the least bit surprised to know I agree with the concerns he expresses about the chill factor that certain murals have. Um, I'm on record saying that I think um, if Italian cyclists had viewed election posters, it would have been less offensive than some of the murals they cycled past two weeks ago. But the, re the reality is that the issue of murals is something which goes way beyond the remit of my department. It illustrates the need for real serious engagement to actually make some sense of a building a united community strategy to build on good work by, done by a number of agencies and see a range of public bodies which have responsibilities in this area, including agencies like the Housing Executive and the Road Service, carrying out their responsibilities to the full. Thank you. And I call Ms. Michaela Boyle. Uh, Kestia Everettree, question three. Principal Deputy Speaker, there was no contact between my private office and the police service before the arrest of Gerry Adams. I do not expect to be notified in advance of operational decisions about specific individuals. And I call Ms. Michaela Boyle for sub 
Gormogad, uh, does the Minister agree with me that the fact that the PSNI contacted the British Secretary of State and indeed ignored your office does nothing to inspire confidence in policing and justice? Indeed, does it not smack in the face of old habits from an old era? Gormogad? I think, Principal Deputy Speaker, Ms Boyle doesn't quite understand the role of the Secretary of State in this area which is entirely different from my role where issues are relating to matters of national security. But I would suggest if she wishes to question the behaviour of the Secretary of State, she should contact the Secretary of State. I am satisfied that the police officers in this case behaved entirely properly. And I call Mr Paul Given. You, Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, not only, I'm sure, Minister, do you agree that the police should be free to carry out their operational duties without fear from any political repercussions, uh, but does he also agree that the police ombudsman's office currently investigating two uh, cases related to Gerry Adams and also the Public Prosecution Service, uh, which asked the Attorney General to carry out an independent review of why it didn't prosecute Mr Adams based on what knowledge he had to do with his niece, should also be free to publish their reports, which currently for the PPS is six months now in waiting, and they, should, they too should be free uh, to publish that report so that the public can see whether or not they have carried out their job. Well, I certainly agree with Mr Given that all the agencies of the justice system should be free to carry out their jobs properly and impartially, as I believe they all seek to do. I also believe that that means it's a responsibility of each of us, and not all in one part of this House, to ensure that pressure is not placed on those agencies. I call Mr Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, following on from that, I'd like to ask the Minister if he's had any discussions with the leaders of Sinn Féin in relation to some of their members' comments uh, in their support or lack of support for the Police Service of Northern Ireland. Uh, I have had no specific discussions on that topic, Principal Deputy Speaker. I believe it should be possible for members of this House to show the political maturity that understands their role without being lectured by a minister. Mr. Fergal McKinney. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I thank the Minister and continuing on from that question, would the Minister agree that Sinn Féin allegations of political policing, accompanied by remarks about how dare they touch our leader, were both wrong and irresponsible? Well, I can only but agree with Mr McKinney. I think it's fairly obvious from the comments that I made that I reject any attempt to interfere in the justice system, any of the relevant agencies, from any quarter. And clearly some of the comments which were made at that time by members of Sinn Féin were entirely inappropriate, as indeed have comments made by members of other parties in other circumstances, for example, over public order matters. I call Mrs Pam Cameron. Question number four, please. Principal Deputy Speaker, with permission, I will take questions 4 and 14 together. I have given a commitment through the Community Safety Strategy that the justice system will tackle hate crime and the harm it causes. My department chairs a multi-agency group set up to deliver the strategy and range of actions being taken to combat hate crime. Legislation is in place which allows for an increase in sentence for offences which are aggravated by hostility because of race, religion, sexual orientation or disability. My department is working with the PSNI to promote the work of hate crime advocates who are a consistent point of contact for victims for practical and emotional advice and assistance. PCSPs also play an important role in making communities safer. Action plans for 2014-15 will identify where interventions are required in tackling hate crimes. A practical measure in place to support victims is the Hate Incident Practical Action Scheme aimed at providing personal protection and safety measures at home. In partnership with the Housing Executive and PSNI, my department is examining ways of promoting and raising awareness of the scheme. In relation to recent racist attacks, I discussed the increase with the Chief Constable and met with the Secretary of State and senior police officers last week regarding action being taken. I also had the opportunity, as you are aware, Principal Deputy Speaker, to attend a recent black and ethnic minority parliament and respond to questions on work being taken forward to tackle these attacks and confirm that such views are not shared or supported by the majority of our people. My officials attended a recent meeting in Belfast City Hall regarding these racist attacks and will participate in any further groups or actions arising from that meeting. And I call Ms Cameron for a supplement. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer and um, add I and my party's condemnation of all racist and hate crimes. Indeed, but can I ask the Minister if he's satisfied with the contribution from the PCSPs in tackling hate crime? 
Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, clearly there are a range of actions being taken by different PCSPs. Uh, I know from the last quarterly meeting with PCSP managers with my officials that a number of them have very significant issues uh, related to their work in their plans for the coming year. Uh, and indeed, I will be writing uh, in the next day or two to PCSPs to encourage them to look at that issue, to look at sharing best practice and using some of the examples which are already underway in some areas to promote action against Tate uh, in all different respects because there is clearly an issue which must be addressed as we seek to look wider at the community safety strategy for all of us. I will call Mr Declan McAleer. Well, will the Minister agree, share the view of uh, Assistant Chief Constable Will Kerr that many of these uh, hate crimes, particularly in parts of Belfast, are orchestrated by the, by the UVF and are effectively a form of ethnic cleansing? Well, that particular issue uh, that Mr McAleer raises has been addressed in the discussions I've had with ACC Care and with other colleagues of his. Uh, there is no doubt that some of the hate crime incidents we have seen, particularly of a racist nature in East Belfast, have had links to the UVF. But we should certainly not suggest that everything connected with hate crime is the responsibility of the East Belfast UVF. Sadly, we've seen hate crime incidents in almost every part of Northern Ireland and in a number of different kinds of areas. But there is no doubt that the police need to uh, ensure that they continue the good work which is already underway, and in particular to tackle that hate crime which comes from specific organisations. Call Mr John Dallet. Uh, Mr Principal, uh, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer. Would the Minister agree with me that hate crime is highly damaging to our international reputation? And would he further agree that it is perhaps time to look at the legislation to ensure that those people guilty of these horrendous crimes are put where they belong, behind bars? Well, I certainly agree with Mr Dallet that hate crime is one of those issues which can be a potential chill factor to people visiting Northern Ireland or people coming to work in Northern Ireland or even, I suspect, people to invest in Northern Ireland. Um, I'm not sure that there is a significant need at this point for a review of the legislation she suggests. Uh, there is, the reality is that we do have the opportunities for enhanced sentencing where issues are related to hate crime and that there are significant uh, matters there uh, where judges can take into account when they award sentences a hate motivation um, in terms of the uh, 2004 uh, criminal justice orders, uh, references to crimes which are aggravated by hostility. But there is clearly a, uh, not always an easy case to be made that a particular crime may have been aggravated by hostility, and it's a matter of looking at the practice of the different agencies to ensure that we get that, uh, that particular motivation taken into account to ensure adequate and appropriate sentencing where it can be. Well, Mr Stewart Dixon. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, uh, in dealing with the whole issue of hate crime, would you agree with me that it is sadly necessary for you and your executive colleagues to reinvigorate the Unite Against Hate campaign uh, in order to uh, re remove the scourge of those who commit these sorts of crimes in Northern Ireland? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, the, um, the original Unite Against Hate campaign, which was launched five years ago, was successful in responding to what was seen at the time as a number of high-profile racist uh, incidents. Um, key partners during that time were the uh, OFM, DFM and the DOJ. Originally, it started with our predecessors in the NIO, as well as the police and the Equality Commission and the Community Relations Council. Uh, to some extent, uh, that campaign has lost impetus in recent time, and I think there may well be a case for seeing that that should be re revamped in the near future. I wrote uh, recently uh, to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister asking that they consider that, asking for an update on the position because it's an OFM-DFM-led campaign and certainly offering my commitment that the Department of Justice would do all it could uh, if we seek to revise the Unite Against Hate campaign, in particular looking at the implications right across Northern Ireland and not merely some of the good work which has been done by Belfast City Council and the police in recent days. And I call Ms. Bronwyn McGahan. Question five. Principal Deputy Speaker, the cost of policing the Twiddell protest now exceed nine million pounds. On the 30th of April 2014, the exact cost was 8.8 .8 million pounds, including opportunity costs of 2.9 million pounds. Ms. McGahan for supplementary. 
Speaker, I, I thank the Minister for his response. Minister, what conversations have you had with the Chief Constable in relation to what gaps in policing has resulted in this amount of money being squandered? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, um, although Ms McGachan raises an interesting point, I can't say I have discussed specific gaps which have opened up because of the money which has been spent on policing to Adele. But what I have discussed is the overall issue. It's clear that, for example, there were significantly fewer arrests over the last year because of public order issues and because of resources being diverted to Twadell around what might, one might call normal crime because of that. And therefore, the community across Northern Ireland was put at greater risk because police were less active. That's effectively the opportunity cost of £2.9 million. And it certainly is something which causes me significant concern that an issue which should not be continuing to cost has cost such a huge amount of money at a time of decreasing resources and we have significant pressures on the police and indeed on other parts of the justice system. It really is time that the Trotel camp went away, people accepted the determination of the Parades Commission and ceased putting pressure on the police service and allowed them to do the job that they should be doing for every part of Northern Ireland. Thank you and I call Mr Alvin McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I could I thank the Minister uh, for his forthright answer in relation to the Trudell um, uh, protest. This enormous amount of money could have been spent, £9 million could have been spent in uh, rejuvenating the communities that live in that area, in Ardoyne and Woodville. Would the Minister agree with me that such a monumental waste of money could easily uh, be set aside if people were to sit down on a neighbourly basis and talk neighbour to neighbour in order to settle uh, this contentious parading dispute. Well, I entirely endorse the point which Mr McGuinness has made. It's clear from some parts of Northern Ireland, most particularly when we look at the engagement between the loyal orders uh, and residents in areas of Derry close to the city walls, that where that engagement has happened, particularly where it's been facilitated by other groups such as the business organisations uh, in the city of Derry, that it has been possible to resolve issues in a way which has reduced that tension, reduced the need for policing even on the days of parades, and certainly not see such an extended standoff with such enormous cost, both in the cost of policing, the cost of what cannot be done elsewhere, and in the damage done to community relations in North Belfast. Thank you. And I call Mr Chris Hazard. The Victim and Witness Care Unit provides victims and witnesses across Northern Ireland with a single point of contact for their case from when the investigation or charge file is submitted to the Public Prosecution Service through to and including the outcome of any court proceedings. That person will contact them through their preferred means, telephone, letter or email, and at a preferred time of day wherever possible. The unit's primary role is to keep victims and witnesses informed of the progress of their case, assess their individual needs, and offer access to additional services where appropriate. The unit provides a range of information, such as if a defendant gets bail and their bail conditions, how to make a victim personal statement, and updates at key stages of the process. The unit will advise victims and witnesses if they're required to give evidence. Where someone is giving evidence, the unit will advise on special measures that may be granted to help them give their best evidence, and the facilities available at court to help them prepare for attending the court. The unit will also advise victims about the court outcome, including any sentence given. The new unit is an excellent example of the value of working in partnership with effective collaboration working between the Public Prosecution Service and the Police Service, supported by staff from Victim Support NI. Victim support staff can provide immediate advice and emotional support, and if necessary, make referral for additional help, such as counselling. Mr. Hazard for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Uh, perhaps the Minister could detail if he has any plans to roll these units out across the north. Well, the, the answer, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, is no, there are no plans to roll out across the north because rolling out right across Northern Ireland happened a week ago. Thank you. And I call Lord Morrow. Thank you, President Deputy Speaker. Uh, could the Minister tell us today how much funding from the offender levy scheme has been directed towards the Victims and Witness Unit to date? 
and what plans has he to fund it over the next 12, 24 months? Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, my department provided approximately £70,000 last year from the Victims of Crime Fund, as Lord Morrow highlights, the offender levy, to enhance the unit services. But fundamentally, uh, the service is provided by the Public Prosecution Service, which is actually funded by DFP and not by my department, so I better not stray too far in that direction. But the additional funding was 70000 Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I did want to ask the Minister if that service will be, uh, will be available throughout the whole of Northern Ireland. So I presume that it is, considering. Mr. Stewart Dixon. Question number eight, Principal Deputy Speaker. At a previous question time, members asked about the possibility of naming and shaming filling stations which have been found by HM Revenue and Customs to be selling illicit diesel. HMRC advice at the time was that Section 18 of the Commissioners of Revenue and Customs Act 2005 has a taxpayer confidentiality clause which makes it an offence to divulge details of anyone in relation to such an investigation and that they could not identify those believed to be evading tax in respect to fuel cases or give information which might lead to their identification. I advise members that I had written to the Economic Secretary to the Treasury asking that the Treasury consider a review of the legislation. I have since received a response. I am pleased to note that the Treasury have assured me of the seriousness with which they view the issue of fuel fraud, the loss of revenue, the undercutting of honest businesses and the environmental impact. In addition, and I welcome this, they have advised that HMRC are reconsidering legislative issues and possible options to allow such naming and shaming for individual petrol station owners involved in this illicit trade. Again, yeah, I call Mr. Dixon for a supplement. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, I know that you uh, chair the Organised Crime Task Force Committee. Can you update us on the wider uh, issues that are being done in order to tackle uh, fuel laundering fraud across Northern Ireland? Well, um, whilst my colleague rightly identifies I chair the OCTF, of course, much of it is responsible of individual agencies within the OCTF, principally HMRC, which is in the lead for a variety of work. Uh, but certainly I have been kept well abreast of the work which they have been doing, developing a new marker for rebated diesel fuel, which is in the process of being introduced over the next 18 months or so, a joint project between HMRC and the Irish Revenue Com Commissioners, uh, which uh, certainly the scientists assure us will be significantly more difficult to launder, if at all possible, than the current uh, markers and therefore should assist significantly in the fight against crime. Uh, there are also regular raids on laundering sites and suspected laundering sites. I have had the pleasure of visiting some of them, although to describe it as pleasure to wade through a kind of sludge from the output of the, uh, the laundering specifically where uh, filtrate is used. Uh, to take the colour out of markers is hardly a pleasure, and to see the environmental damage which is being done to rivers and burns across Northern Ireland is quite horrifying in that respect. We also, in December last, introduced legislation which will allow unduly lenient sentences for uh, excise evasion on fuel to be referred to the Court of Appeal by the DPP, and that I hope will also show uh, that if uh, sentences, are, uh, sentences are awarded which are not sufficiently serious, uh, that they will be followed up in a way which will ensure custodial sentences where appropriate. Thank you. And I call Mr. Ross Hussey. The Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service ensures that its estate meets the needs of people with a disability by commissioning disability audits for each venue and, as far as reasonably practical, implementing their recommendations. A rolling programme of work has been undertaken to upgrade the estate and improve and enhance access for disabled service users. I call Mr Hussey for a very brief supplement. I, I thank the Minister for his, for his answer and he's made reference to disabled access. Would he agree with me that disabled facilities in most of these areas are very poor? Well, I'll give a very brief answer, Principal Deputy Speaker. No, I would not agree that. Certainly in some of our older courthouses, facilities are less than ideal. But in our modern courthouses, I believe facilities for disabled people are by and large extremely good. And thank you very much. That is the end of, of the period for oral questions. And we now move on to topical questions. And uh, I see that Mr. Jim Allister is not in his place. So I call Mr. Roy Beggs. Thank you, Principal uh, Deputy Speaker. 
So-called uh, uh, legal high suppliers often change their formula to evade the, uh, the uh, uh, misuse of drugs legislation, but uh, Belfast City Council successfully used the general uh, product safety regulation to address uh, le um, ha legal highs in the Belfast area. Uh, and my colleague Mark McKinney took that issue to Larnborough Council and gained the support of Council and the PSNI to do the same uh, type of raid in Larn last week. So my question to the Minister is, how is his department working closely with local government to learn the lessons and assist in removing these products which have severe adverse effect on our young people uh, from, from the streets? Well, I thank Mr Briggs for the question which uh, featured also at last question time. Uh, the reality is that the issue of uh, legal highs and other such substances is not an issue for the DOJ to address directly, but my department certainly cooperated in arrangements with Belfast City Council Environmental Health Officers, which saw, and I think it was five shops uh, raided and prosecutions taken last year under the, uh, the regulations which were highlighted by Mr. Beggs uh, regarding general product safety as opposed to anything specifically relating to dangerous drugs. My understanding is that EHOs then spread that information to other council colleagues across Northern Ireland. I don't think Larne is the second council. I think OMA may have been the second, but certainly there have been a number of cases where the issues have been considered and where work is being done by EHOs and the police service. Uh, my officials have been assisting where appropriate with that but we have not been taking the lead. Mr. Beggs for a supplementary. I thank the, the Minister for his, uh, his answer and would declare an interest as a, as a treasurer of the Carrick Fergus Community Drugs and Alcohol Advisory Group. But with regards to Larn, would the Minister agree that a relatively small amount of seed funding from the Police and Community Safety uh, Partnership can, can bring about great benefits in local communities addressing drugs misuse through organisations such as Preventing Addiction Larn. And how effective does he believe the current funding uh, spent from the Police and Community Safety Partnership has been in Larn? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I don't have the detail of how Larn spends its PCSP budget, but I think Mr Beggs has highlighted a very positive issue, which is uh, individual areas looking at the needs of their area seeing how small sums of money given to NGOs can frequently be beneficial uh, in fighting crime and promoting uh, community safety, and also the further point which I made of ensuring that such good practice is then shared. Not that people assume that what works in Lahn will always work in Fermanagh, but that lessons are learned and applied as appropriate in other districts. So I think it's a very good example of how PCSPs are working in the way which I hope they would when we introduced the idea to this Assembly in 2011. You, and I call Mr Phil Flanagan. Kuri, the Minister will be aware of the, the tragic drowning of Lee Rogers and Ennis Gillen at, at the weekend and I want to take this opportunity to express my sincerest, sincerest condolences to the family and friends of Lee um, and I want to commend all those involved in the, the search and rescue operation. But can I ask the Minister if his department would consider taking the lead in, in coordinating an updated safety awareness campaign involving both the emergency services and voluntary organisations um, to encourage people to be safe on the water, particularly at times of, of good weather? Well, I certainly would also wish to add my condolences to Lee's family, as Mr Flanagan has done. Uh, the Department of Justice has taken the lead in coordinating uh, search and rescue in terms of its liaison with other agencies across the UK and indeed with Irish agencies as well. Uh, the Department is not, however, formally in the lead and there's a, uh, a slightly difficult position where DECAL in particular has some responsibilities um, around particularly mountain and cave rescue and others such as lowland search and rescue are not uh, particularly the responsibility of any department in terms of coordination. I agree that there is a need for joining up. I'm not entirely convinced at this stage that the DOJ is the appropriate department to do that coordination, given that much of it currently rests with DECAL. But the important thing is that we do see executive departments working together with the relevant agencies to ensure that we provide the best possible way of providing the sort of support which is needed, whether it be uh, by mountain and, and cliff and cave rescue, whether it be by lowland search and rescue, whether it be by the RNLI. Call Mr Flanagan for supplement. 
I, I thank the, the Minister for his answer, and I agree with him. I don't really care who takes the lead on it as long as this is done. So, uh, will the Minister be prepared to engage in, in roundtable discussions with the DKL Minister, with some of her officials, and with voluntary organisations like the RNLI, uh, the North West um, Mountain Rescue Team, and, and, and those from the Sligo Coast Guard, um, to help the emergency services ensure that there is a better proactive and reactive um, campaign to deal with these types of issues? Well, I have already been engaged in a number of discussions and indeed have met, for example, Lowland Search and Rescue, and I met the Northwest Mountain Rescue at their base in County Fermanagh, which I never quite realised was the Northwest. So uh, there, are, you know, there are discussions ongoing, but certainly I, th I think what has been highlighted in the tragedy this weekend is the need to ensure that we bring those discussions to a conclusion as speedily as possible. Thank you. And I call Mr. Alistair Ross. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I return to the issue of, of fuel laundering? And I'm sure the Minister will have seen uh, reports in the news this morning uh, about uh, some of those involved in illegal fuel laundering, recruiting scientists to try to break some of the, uh, the markers in the fuel that they referred to earlier. Uh, can I ask the Minister if he shares with me the frustration and anger that many of those involved in illegal fuel laundering haven't appeared before the courts and haven't been convicted? Well, I can certainly share the anger that people who are committing crimes have not been made amenable for those crimes yet. I know that good work is being done by HMRC and by the police. The reality, unfortunately, in many cases is the kind of work which is going on in fuel laundering is not something which involves teams of people sitting in a laboratory, uh, but frequently these things are carried out automatically with very limited human contact to the point where the crimes are being committed. So it is not a particularly easy task. That's why the importance that has been highlighted of addressing a better marker issue has to be progressed. But there is also good work being done by HMRC on a regular basis, but we have to acknowledge that the scale of it in Northern Ireland is significantly higher than in any other region of these islands, and that is creating problems for the law enforcement agencies. Well, Mr. Ross, for supplement. Thank you. And can I ask the Minister then, is it an additional, additional difficulty for the law uh, agencies here in Northern Ireland uh, to catch those involved in illegal fuel laundering, uh, given that the National Crime Agency isn't able to operate here in Northern Ireland. And would he uh, again reiterate the call this morning for those parties who are refusing to allow the NCA to operate in Northern Ireland to allow that to happen so that the criminals who are involved in illegal fuel laundering can be caught and brought before the courts? Well, if Mr Ross wishes me to agree again of the vital necessity of getting the NCA in place to fight crime in the devolved sphere, I would happily agree with him. The practical reality on the issue of fuel laundering is that excise duty is a non-devolved issue and therefore the NCA would be potentially available to assist HMRC. The reality, of course, is that many of these criminals are carrying out other criminal activity, much of which is devolved, and therefore that in itself creates difficulty for the NCA as to exactly where the boundaries would lie. But he better not be too specific about excise uh, duty evasion though the, the point he makes is absolutely right. And I certainly trust that members of this House who have till now been reluctant to see us move forward on allowing the NCA to help us in the fight against crimes like trafficking and child exploitation will see the necessity to do that in line with the safeguards which have been secured. I call Mr Ian McRae. No doubt the Minister won't be surprised at my question, but um, could he give the House an update on the discussions around Desert Creek? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, though it's no surprise whatsoever, um, I'm afraid since the matter currently rests with the Programme Board uh, looking at the issue of cost reduction, I'm not in a position to give any specific update at this stage. I hope that by the middle of next month we'll be in a better position to see what cost reduction exercise has amounted to and what it is possible to achieve. But certainly, um, to give him what, what he really wants to hear, I'm happy to confirm to Mr McRae that the Department of Justice remains committed to world-class training facilities for the three services together at Desert Creek. Mr McRae for supplementary. Um, the Minister has indeed um, given me the answer that I really uh, wanted, but the Minister will be aware that there is a lot of frustration out there indeed with the talk from other constituencies across Northern Ireland of suggesting that they would be better suited having facilities of former um, um, sites, army barrack sites, etc. But can the minister, and, and he has done, but can I ask him again to give us assurance that he will continue to um, battle through the difficulties to ensure that this is provided in Cookstown and work alongside the executive colleagues to try and make that a reality once and for all? Well, I can certainly give a commitment that the DOJ 
uh, and insofar as we therefore speak for the prison service and working with colleagues in the police service, will continue to show its commitment. Um, I trust Mr. McRae will subject the Minister for Health, Social Services and Public Safety to the same questioning on behalf of the Fire and Rescue Service. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sean Rogers. Principal Deputy Speaker, Minister, could I ask you to give us an update on the unacceptable uh, delay in the hearing of Article 2 compliant inquests? Well, I think what, what has been highlighted is, is quite clear about the significant issues that we have in dealing with the past generally, of how that ties in with inquests in particular, and there are huge issues relating to resourcing in that matter. Uh, members are well aware of the concerns that I have with the fact that we failed to reach agreement in the talks chaired by Dr. Richard Haas last year and in the party leaders' talks since then to find a comprehensive way of dealing with the past. The reality, of course, is that to be strictly technical, many of these historic inquests will never be Article 2 compliant because Article 2 requires speedy action, and we could no longer say it was speedy, but we must seek to make them as compliant as possible as fast as we can. The reality is, without the resources that we need, and given the large number of cases which are currently in the system relating to historic inquests, the position is extremely difficult. I do hope that if the House is prepared to pass the Legal Aid and uh, Coroner's Courts Bill by giving the appropriate responsibilities to the Chief Constable, to, sorry, to the Chief Constable, to the Lord Chief Justice uh, and others, uh, we, will, um, we will be able to see that we can get better direction into the work of the coroner's service, but it will also be essential that additional resources are provided to the DOJ to carry out the, the administrative work that goes with that. And call Mr. Rogers Could I thank the Minister for his answer, and he probably agree with me, we have a major responsibility to the families of the deceased, some of them who have gone to the grave without getting, getting answers. But if it is a matter of resourcing, have you pursued this vigorously with the Secretary of State and other uh, individuals with specific responsibility in that area? Well, I have certainly raised the issue with the Secretary of State. Um, in my view, this particular section of the House report, uh, looking at the HIU, was the best way in which we could have ensured a proper investigation of a number of areas, including those which currently fall to the police ombudsman, those which currently fall to the historical inquiries team, and those which fall to legacy inquests. Uh, in the circumstances in which a new unit was set up, I believe we would have had a right to go to both the UK government and the Irish government to seek additional resources for that. In the absence of that agreement, it's very difficult to see how we would make the case for the additional resources which we so badly need. Thank you, and I call Mr. Ross Hussey. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Is the Minister aware of the content of a document prepared by the Deputy Chief Constable in relation to the future of the part-time police? No, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm not aware, but I suspect a member of the Policing Board is now about to tell me. <laughs> well, Mr. Hussey, for his supplement. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I am not aware of the content of the document, but I... I <laughs> I am aware it exists, and I thought I would ask somebody more important who might know the answer. But would the uh, Minister agree with me that, that part-time police officers are an essential backbone of the police service, and part-time police service should be encouraged and, in fact, should be part of the, of the policing plan of the future? I note Mr Hussey didn't declare his past interest in such matters, unusually. Uh, uh, there is cer I mean, certainly, uh, both here and in other regions of the UK, it's clear, Principal Deputy Speaker, that part-time police officers have performed a valuable uh, role in different times. And, of course, we also see the operation of police and community support officers in different parts of England and Wales. So there are a variety of models which would provide some additional support to the police. The precise way in which that would uh, work is very much an operational issue for the Chief Constable, the Deputy Chief Constable, and the approval of the Policing Board. And uh, Ms Claire Sugden is not in her place, so I call Mr Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister uh, to give the House an update in relation to the discussion between the prison service and the chaplaincy service uh, within our prisons? Principal Deputy Speaker, um, the best way in which chaplaincy services are provided to prisoners has been under discussion for a period of time uh, with uh, various senior church representatives because there are a number of religious bodies currently have chaplains. Uh, there are, as ever, issues relating to both cost 
and most appropriate way of providing these services. My understanding uh, is that following the circulation of a proposal from the present service to uh, at least the four senior church representatives, I'm not sure how many others may have been involved because there are issues also of the role of the lead chaplain in, in different prisons. Uh, there have, you know, have been some partial responses, but not yet full responses. So I'm not entirely clear where the churches stand. But what I believe we need to do is to ensure that along with the other aspects of providing efficiency, we do ensure that proper chaplaincy services are provided for the support which chaplains provide, in particular, to vulnerable prisoners. Thank you, Minister. And uh, that ends the time for uh, questions, including topicals. And we now must 